This is Fresh Air. I'm Terry Gross. Records like For the Love of Money, Me and Mrs. Jones, I'll Be Around, If You Don't Know Me By Now, Love Train, Break Up to Make Up, and TSOP, a.k.a. the Soul Train theme, helped define what became known in the 70s as the Philly sound. My guests are two of the main architects of that sound, Kenny Gamble and Leon Huff. In 1971, they co-founded Philadelphia International Records and went on to write and produce many of the label's hits. The label was home to such groups as Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes, the OJs, Billy Paul, and McFadden and Whitehead. The new box set Love Train collects many of the hits from Philadelphia International Records, along with some Gamble and Huff collaborations that precede the label. Before we meet Gamble and Huff, let's hear one of the hits they wrote and produced. From 1972, this is the OJs with Backstabbers. Gamble, Leon Huff, welcome to Fresh Air. Um, now, Leon Huff, was that you on, on the piano at the very beginning? Yes. Okay. Tell us about figuring out what you were going to play there. Back, backstabber sounds like something like eerie, you know, something eerie. like. So that role was like something horrible because that's what backstabbers are. So that role reflected that type of a drama. And it worked. Okay, so after we hear that opening, then the rhythm section comes in, and then the strings, and it's it's a really big production, which is something that Philadelphia International really specialized in. Um, Kenny Gamble, you want to talk about that 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 kind of big produced orchestral sound that you got? Well, you know that sound uh, of the orchestra was always uh, that was our dream to uh, to be able to play. Uh, so many counter melodies that came along with those uh, those songs that the orchestra was able to uh, to put that together. And plus, too, you know, um, uh, during the time when we were coming along, it was stereo. Stereo radio had just come into really like it's putting it in cars. I mean, it was everywhere. Stereo went from mono to stereo, and so you had a lot of space, you know, to fill up. You know, stereo was much more uh, soothing than mono, so we had uh, we thought about the mixes that we could do, and 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 the music was was not only um, funky; it was classical at the same time. So the string players and horn players, you know, we had the the greatest orchestra. I think MFSB that was uh, the name of the orchestra. How did you know? Um a lot about the instruments of the orchestra that you wouldn't typically hear in in a small band, like like French horns yeah, or right, flugel right. horns. Like, yeah. did you study that kind of? Like, how yeah. did you develop an ear for those kinds of instruments? Well, I, I've I come in contact with those types of in- instruments because I, I I was in a band in, in elementary school, marching band. Oh. I, I love marching. I was, was in a band like that too. Great experience, <laughs> yeah. you know. So I had the opportunity to hear trombones and oh, uh-huh. French horns and flutes and piccolos and all that kind of good stuff that makes up a fantastic orchestra. So that's how I became familiar, you know, vibes, bells, maracas, shakers, tambourines, the whole nine yards, and gamble experienced the same thing, too. That's why we was able to incorporate those type of sounds. Kenny Gamble, were you in a marching band also? No, no, not no marching band, but um, we had a band, and um, 
I think that the music that influenced me most, you know, from like the early, late 50s, like Burt Bacharach, Hal David, and um, Libra and Stroller, you know what I mean? The Drifters, when they had strings and, and their, they first introduced the strings. And, yeah, and strings and timpani and everything. Yeah. You know, there goes my baby. I think that was probably one of the first mm -hmm. songs that had a um, full orchestra. And then Dionne Warwick and Burt Bacharach and Hal David. I mean, they did some fantastic arrangements and they used all kinds of instruments doing that. And, and the rhythmic. Uh, uh, things so, so we we were a products of of, uh, of that era, and also the Motown era, which had the greatest of, uh, influence, which also used a lot of horns and baritone saxes and things like that. So, we stretched out, and plus Tommy Bell, Bobby Martin, the arrangers, they would also make suggestions from time to time. Well, why don't you use an oboe over here or this or whatever, and uh, and, and and it all worked. You know, work together once once we were able to uh, get in that studio. Let's hear um, let's hear another great track from Philadelphia International Records. It's on the new box set, and we're gonna hear "If You Don't Know Me by Now" by Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes. And Teddy Pendergrass sings lead on this. And I think Leon Huff, you're the one who discovered that Teddy Pendergrass could sing as good as he did. Well, you know, caught my ear. You know, at, in a rehearsal. His particular sound. The big, he, he was the drummer with the band. Did you know that he, he could sing? No, not really. You know, he just, his voice just stood out, you know, amongst the other voices. And uh, it just grabbed your ear. Mine, anyway, at first. Plus, how Melvin knew that he could sing, you know. Hal was really the architect of that group, of the, the Blue Notes. He'd been in the Blue Notes since in the late 50s. And so that's why eventually what we decided to do is call it Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes because the Blue Notes kept changing, and but Harold Melvin remained there all the time. And then Teddy Pendergrass came along. <laughs> His voice uh, roared. Yeah, so we called it Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes featuring Teddy Pendergrass. Did Harold Melvin mind that Teddy Pendergrass was singing lead and not Harold Melvin. Yeah, he minded. <laughs> yeah, he minded because he, he was Harold Melvin in the Blue Notes, and people thought that Teddy Pendergrass was Harold Melvin. Right. And so he used to come to me and say, "Man, they think that uh, <laughs> Teddy's Harold Melvin." I said, "Well, you know, don't worry about it. That you know, was, but uh, yeah, that was that power shining you know. through." Well, before we hear, if you don't know me by by now, do you want to say anything else to introduce it about how you wrote the song, for instance? All I knew we was in the room in Gamble's office, that's where the piano was, the old upright. When we was just the ideas were just coming. I don't know how that song came about. I just Well, you just go and I suppose you got a, a friend or you're in a relationship. So I said they said, Well where you been at? You know. I was working, I was doing what it's you know, and then you, all of a sudden you say, Well, if you don't know me by now, you'll never know me. I mean that's like a relationship kind of mm -hmm. thing where People have gone through that. Everybody's gone through that. Millions of people are going through that every day. But we haven't written songs about it, so what made you realize yeah. that was a good hook for a song? The well, ideas pop into your head. It you was know? just feeling good. And you and so uh, Huff and I, we used to write titles down. You know, we come in with a with a, mm -hmm. with a legal pad full of nothing but titles, and that's how we would get our songs because the title, each title had a story to it. So we're playing around and messing around and... Yeah, pick chords. one. Just yeah, pick, yeah one. pick one. And then all of a sudden, you know, if you don't know me by now, you'll never know me. Seemed like it fit the order of the day. Okay, so this is Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes from 1972 with Teddy Pendergrass singing lead. And my guests, Kenny Gamble and Leon Huff, wrote the song and produced the record. Right. And won a Grammy. And won a Grammy for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That we've been through You 
you should understand me like I understand you. Now, baby, I know the difference between right and wrong. I ain't gonna do nothing to upset our happy home. Like children, when we argue for the fight, hey, hey. if you don't know, if you don't die now, you will never, never, never know. You'll never, never, never know me. Hey, hey. That's Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes with Teddy Pendergrass singing lead, recorded in 1972, written and produced by my guests. Kenny Gamble and Leon Huff. And while we were listening to that, Kenny Gamble, you were telling me something I want you to repeat. Well, I, I just wanted to let you know that <laughs> uh, during the background, see, Huff and myself and Bunny Sigler, we used to do a lot of backgrounds on records. <laughs> because not saying that the group wasn't really good, but the certain sound that we wanted. And so on that, if you don't know me by now, is, is uh, Gamble, Huff, and Bunny Sigler. We're doing the, the background. Oh, yeah, that. boy, they can harmonize, boy. Yeah, me and Huff and Buddy <laughs> I mean, we really had a good sound together. And and in fact, like on a lot of stylistic songs, you know, we sang on the stylistic songs in the background. And uh, Joe Simon, we sang on Joe Simon. Archie was, Bell. Archie and Bell, we were, we were the drills. I mean, you know, Are so. You yeah. <laughs> That's so, funny. so if you don't know me by now, we were singing that. Uh, I don't know if I could hit them notes again, but. Yeah. Well, well, that leads, leads me right to where I want to go. I mean, I know you used to sing in a group called the Romeos. Oh, yeah. yeah. We had a we had a lot of fun with the Romeos. And uh, Huff and uh, Roland Chambers, Carl Chambers. Yeah, it was great. Winnie time. Wolford and uh, Tom Bell and myself. You know, we, we were an excellent band, mm-hmm. and um, we sang together. We had sort of like the best part of the band when, you know, was when... Uh, we used to sing songs like The Four Freshmen. You know what I mean? We'd have that kind of modern harmony kind of mm-hmm. songs. And we, we did the, 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 the standard uh, Moon River. We had a great arrangement of Moon River. And we had a great arrangement of um, I Wish You Love. Oh, yeah. Huh. Huff would play the, the drums on there. Mm-hmm. And Roland and, um, and Carl, his brother, and we would sing together. So... So we could sing a little bit, you know. Oh, yeah. Neither of you is going to do a few bars of Moon River for me? I don't care to it. No. You know, I can't even hardly remember it. I know it had a bass line boom. Doom, 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 Something like that. It was great, you know. It was funny. That that was the highlight of my my early music career as a musician from Camden, New Jersey. At that time... I felt like I could play good enough to join a band, and and I kept hearing about Kenny Gamble and Romeo's appearing down at this club in Longside, New Jersey, called Loretta's Hi Hat. And I had a day gig at Cooper Hospital, but every weekend, see, word of mouth is powerful. You better believe it. And that's all I heard it was Kenny Gamble, Kenny Gamble, it was Kenny Gamble and the Romeo's. They down there. So I had an opportunity to be off one weekend, and I, I caught a ride down there, and. I, and they had lines around the corner, people trying to get into this club. They had bus loads. I mean, you might have thought the, the Rolling Stones or somebody, <laughs> you know. So it took me about an hour to get in. But once I got in, then I could see why, because they was rocking the place. Yeah. So me as a musician, I could say, I could, oh, I could be in a band like that. Because I thought I could play that good, you know, at that time, you know. Well, you know, I should mention early, Leon Huff, early in your career, you also did some session work for Phil Spector. Yeah. Played piano on the, Phil, the mm. famous Phil Spector yeah. Christmas album. That's right. You did work with Leon and, with Lieber and Stoller. Yeah. Um, so uh, did that? Did, did you think that that was your future, doing mm. session work? Or did you think you'd become a songwriter dreams. producer? I wanted to be, you know, as a young boy, I always had albums in my house. My mother used to take us to music stores, albums, I used to read liner notes. I used to do all of that, you know. To read liner notes? I used to read, then they had liner notes in back of albums. Oh, uh-huh, yeah, you know, yeah. I used to read all of them, you know. And, and I always wanted to be a studio musician. That's what I wanted to do. What did you learn from working with Phil Spector and Lieber and Stoller, great producers, that you applied to Philadelphia International Records? 
Phil Spector had a whole different approach. Like, like what? Uh, what did he do? The, you know, the wall of sound, you know. You know, you have every every in, individual musician play their part down, you know. Then he worked for hours on the drum sound. He'll tell all the musicians to take a break. And he'll be in there like two or three hours just working with them drums. So if you listen to his productions, then you'll see that uh, it sounds like nothing else. My guests are Kenny Gamble and Leon Huff. They co-founded Philadelphia International Records in 1971, which had dozens of hits and defined the Philly sound. They have a new box set called Love Train. More after a break. This is Fresh Air. If you're just joining us, my guests are Kenny Gamble and Leon Huff, the creators of Philadelphia International Records, who they had a zillion hits. Um, they're producers, songwriters, and performers, <laughs> and um, there's a new four CD box set that collects just some of their work together. And the box set actually starts before you founded Philadelphia International Records with some of the hits that you had for yeah. other record labels. Mm -hmm. And I want to play one of those. And I think this is the first real hit that you had. It's from 1967, and it's Expressway to Your Heart, The Soul Survivors. Um, so. Tell us how this recording came to be. Why don't you start with writing writing the song? And, and let me say, you, you're you from Philadelphia, Kenny Gamble, Leon Huff. You're from Camden. Close enough. Yeah, <laughs> and, that's, East, that's East Philly, Camden. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just right yeah. over the river yeah, in New right. Jersey. <laughs> yeah. And there is an expressway in Philadelphia called the right. Schuylkill Expressway that yeah. is famous for its unpredictable traffic jams. Right. So does the Schuylkill Expressway, is that the expressway referred to in Expressway to Your Heart? Were that's you thinking it. about that? Yeah. Well, that's it. Gamma that's wrote the lyrics. Yeah. I think it's one of the most clever lyrics I've ever heard. Yeah. You know. What happened with that song, it's sort of like it's self-explanatory. I was on my way over to see um, a friend of mine, a young lady. So the expressway was just backed up. That's when they first started the expressway. This is 67, so it was just beginning. I'm sitting there for, it seemed like hours, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I started beating on the dashboard. You know, talking about express way to your heart, <laughs> trying to get to you. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's how I come through. Then I see you huff. I said, huff, express way to your heart. And you put that bass line, do, 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 do. And that was, you know, yeah. that's how songs come, though. Songs come from uh, um, from your imagination. You just got to be quick. You got to be quick to, to capture the moment mm. for the concepts. And, um, so when you were in the car writing that song on the way to see... Your woman friend? Yeah. Who did you end up seeing first, Leon Huff or, or her? Oh, I saw her first. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, her first. Her. Yeah, yeah, I saw her first. Yeah. So you kept it in I your mind. Her, oh, I saw Huff the next day. Yeah, okay. But I write stuff down, though, because yeah. you know, I forget it. Now, now, Leon Huff, did you think what this song needs to start with? Well, first of all, it starts with horns. Like, you know, horns, car horns car honking horns. in traffic. And the horns are tuned. I mean... If there's, there's they a sound line, like it, don't they? Yeah. yeah, there's a line with like one horn, and th then that line is repeated in, in different pitch in another horn, and they're in harmony with each other. So, <laughs> it sound like it. Are those real car horns, or did you? Oh, yeah, they're real car horns. But you know where that was inspired a little bit by? There was a song called uh, Summer in the City. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hunt down, Summer in the City. And they, had, yeah. they, had, they had car horns. That's in true, and stuff they like did. That. Yeah, so, yeah, Joe yeah. Taj and I, we just. He was um, the engineer, Joe He Tarja. was the engineer, yeah. and so we just. We got some, they have these sound effect records where you can, they have car horns on it. They got everything on them, sound effect records. And so we just used the car horns on it. And uh, just one more thing about that song yeah. that, that a lot of people don't know is that we use the same lyrics in the expressway that we used in a song with the Temptations and the Supremes, I'm Gonna Make You Love Me. Wait, what's, I know. You know, I, I know that, that song, but I'm trying okay. to think of what the similarity right. is. Okay, the temptations. I'm gonna make you love me this way. Every minute, every hour, I'm gonna shower you with love and affection. Look, it's coming your direction. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you see it now, right? Yes. Yeah, now, in, in, in your way, direction, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. The same thing. Sounds coming in your direction on the expressway. Oh. Same thing. See? Is that cheating? Nah, <laughs> no, no. That's 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 being beautiful. That's that's really taking advantage of. Uh, of creativity, you know. You can say a lot of things in a lot of different ways. Yeah. So. Good. Okay. Well, this is a great record. I've always loved this record. Yeah. It's Expressway to Your Heart, The Soul Survivors, 1967, written by my guests Gamble and Huff, and produced by you too, right? Yeah, we produced it. And Leon Huff, are you playing on this? Yes. Is you at the piano? Mm -hmm. oh, okay, here yeah. we go.
took too long I got caught in the rush hour The fellas started to shower You with love and affection Now you won't look in my direction On the expressway To your Kenny Gamble and Leon Huff will be back in the second half of the show. Their new Philly Sound box set is called Love Train. I'm Terry Gross, and this is Fresh Air. This is Fresh Air. I'm Terry Gross, back with the songwriting and production team Kenny Gamble and Leon Huff. They co-founded Philadelphia International Records in 1971, which defined the Philly Sound. They modeled their label on Motown Records. They have a new Philly Sound box set called Love Train, named after one of Gamble and Huff's many hits, When we left off, they were talking about writing and producing the hit Expressway to Your Heart, which they recorded with the Soul Survivors before Gamble and Huff founded their own label. What impact did that recording have on your careers? Expressway? Boy, it had a tremendous impact. And um, I think one of the good things about it was that the Soul Survivors was a great performing act. Mm -hmm. They, They were performing places and just turning the places out, mm-hmm. but it, it was like a breakthrough for us, for Gamble and Huff, because um, it seems like everything started to happen from then, because right after, during the same time as the Expressway, we recorded The Intruders with Cowboys to Girls. Love that song. So yeah. we had been trying with The Intruders, with United, together, we had had four or five different records before them, build, they were building, but then, Cowboys the Girls came out and just exploded. So we was on uh we was on a roll. That's when we went up to Motown. You know, yeah. went up to Motown. We had Expressway on the charts and Cowboys the Girls. Yeah. Had two records like in, in the top ten. So we figured we'd go to Motown, you know. And why didn't you stay there? Like what didn't work when you were thinking of, uh, of well I think it was there. I think it was uh, kinda of far away number one. You mm-hmm. know, our families were here in Philadelphia. Uh-huh. And uh, I think we were just basically on exploratory, just, you know, let's see what's up there, because we had admired them so much, you know. Yeah. And um, we met uh, Holland Dozier and Holland. We met uh, Norman Whitfield. We met all these great songwriters and producers that yeah. that we admired for so many years. And, and we wanted to see whether or not there was an opportunity yeah, at Motown. Yeah, that's all it was. But what happened was is that from... Um, from a business standpoint and from a, a, a logistics standpoint, I think that me and Huff decided when we were there, we said, hey, I think we better try to do this back in Philly. Mm. You know, and, and, and you know, it, thank God it worked out real, real up. good for us. The timing was good. And, and Motown will always be my favorite uh, record company. Mm-hmm. Now, you know how you said you kept a list of titles mm. and then eventually wrote songs that would grow out of the titles? Was Cowboys to Girls one of the titles that was on your list before it was a song? Oh, yeah. yeah it was on the No list. question about it. And do you remember how it got on the list in the first place? Cowboys and Girls, because it's a story. That story is like a story about a guy who grows up, like little little kids, they grow up, and the guy be beating the girls up, and they be pulling their hair, and, you know, they don't treat them tender. And then all of a sudden he grows up and says, hey, you know, now I know girls are made for kissing. <laughs> you know, ain't a fun reminiscing. And the girl, she went from baby dolls to boys. You know, what I mean, so it's just it's just clever. I tried to the <laughs> lyrics that we were trying to put together was something that was a little bit different and a little like Expressway to Your Heart was different, right? Cowboys to Girls was different, you know, and and uh, it, I, it's, it's so many other ones I can't think of them right now. But try to take a different angle to songs like Smokey Robinson used to write songs like The Tears of a Clown, and you know. Um, you know, different, you know, try to be as clever as possible. That's the word, mm-hmm. clever. So let's squeeze in Cowboys to Girls. It's one of the songs featured on the new 4CD box set of songs mostly from Philadelphia International Records, but also some of the songs that that were Gamble and Huff collaborations before they created 
Philadelphia International, and this is one of those songs that they did before Philadelphia International Records. Sure. This is Cowboys to Girls. <laughs> Cowboys to Girls, written by my guests, Kenny Gamble and Leon Huff, the founders of Philadelphia International Records, and there's a new four-CD box set that collects music from Philadelphia International Records and some of the Gamble and Huff collaborations that preceded that record label. Now, you, you, uh, you're from Philly. You've been working Philly and Camden, and <laughs> Philadelphia International Records has been headquartered in Philadelphia. Um, which was also the home when you were getting started of American Bandstand with Dick Clark. And that had a really b strong impact on the Philadelphia music scene. And the record label Cameo Parkway, which was based in Philadelphia, had a lot of performers that ended up being stars on Bandstand, including Dee Dee Sharp, uh, Chubby Checker and his record The Twist, Bobby Rydell. Frankie Avalon. Frankie Avalon. Fabian. O Orleans. The Dovells. The Orleans. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was... Uh, a tremendous music. Uh, uh, so, so, so what impact did that have on you, having the Cameo Parkway label feeding American Bandstand? Like, what, what did you learn from, from watching that? Hmm. Well, we learned so much from them is that our offices, is, we're in the same offices that Cameo Parkway. Um, where they used to be. Where they used to be, 309 South Broad Street. And, and you had the engineer that they used to have. Same engineer. We bought that building like in 1970, 71. And uh, I think Cameo Parkway was another learning tool for us because they basically had a group of writers, too. They were, I mean, Motown was inspired them because when you go to Cameo Parkway, they had a library and they had every Motown <laughs> record you could think of. And all the writers at Cameo Parkway was basically listening to Motown records trying to really duplicate the Motown sound. And I think... Uh, um, uh, Cameo Parkway and, and Bandstand. Bandstand, to me, was like American Idol is today. You could get an artist on Bandstand um, during that time, and he performed his record, and in a day or two, he had the number one record in the country because Bandstand had that much influence in the in the music industry. I, th I think I think the period when you start having hits is past when Bandstand was really still based in Philadelphia. Oh, it was gone then. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Bandstand was gone. So yeah. you couldn't really break your records on Bandstand. No, no. in no. fact, Soul Train had come into play. Well, that's right. Where I'm heading is Soul Train. Yeah, Soul Train was was was. I mean, it's, we started around sixty three, sixty four, <laughs> somewhere around there, and you go all the way to um, to from that era to Bandstand leaving, going to California, and Soul Train sort of picked up where Bandstand left off at. You wrote the record that became the theme for Soul Train, TSOP, The Sound of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess my first question about that is, why did you do an instrumental? I mean, instrumentals were basically, um, they'd kind of fallen from fashion. By the time that you did this, the things had vocals on them. So why, why did you even think about doing an instrumental? Mm. Well, you know, it had words to it too. Yeah, you know, the three degrees was uh, on there. Soul train, soul train, da 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 da. Soul train. I mean, you know, he was singing soul train. Plus two, uh, we always looked at it like Johnny Carson. You know, he had a theme song. You know, da, 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 that's Johnny Carson. Mm -hmm. All right, you take Bob Hope. He's got thanks for the memories. <laughs> yeah. You mm -hmm. understand? Everybody, everybody great has has kind of like you know from television has a theme song. 
So we wanted to give Don Cornelius a theme song. Did he ask you to write one? Yeah, he came. He oh, came I didn't into Philly. That. No, he came oh, into he Philly. Asked you. you know, because the music he had on there, he was a real good friend of ours. He still is a good friend of ours. You know, and all of our artists was on his show. You know, and so in talking to him one day, we we're talking about his theme song. I said, "You need to get a better theme song." So he said, "I'll come in." So he came in, and and uh, me and Huff and all the musicians we got together. Mm. And like the first day, like Huff always said, we didn't get too much the first day. Mm-mm. So me and Huff went back to the office, and that melody came up. That's da, da, so train, so train. and then once you got that melody, then then you put the other pieces to it. I put that, da, 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 da. <laughs> you know what I mean, and then that. That did it, you know. <laughs> so, okay. So this is TSOP, the Sound of Philadelphia, which you also know as the theme from Soul Train, and this was uh, written and produced by my guests Kenny Gamble and Leon Huff. We'll talk more with the songwriting and production team Kenny Gamble and Leon Huff, co-founders of Philadelphia International Records, after a break. Their new box set is called Love Train. This is Fresh Air. My guests are Kenny Gamble and Leon Huff. They co-founded Philadelphia International Records in 1971, which had dozens of hits and defined the Philly sound. They have a new box set called Love Train. Let me play another record that you wrote together. Mm -hmm. and that you produced. And this is Me and Mrs. Jones, which Billy Paul recorded. And I've read that you have described this as one of the trickiest songs that you did, and I'm wondering what was tricky about it? That's probably was me telling that, because it was just, I had a different feel. It was more jazz orientated to Mm -hmm. we. Mm -hmm. I remember when Gamma was showing me the chords, because she had the chord progressions. I seen the intro, and I couldn't catch it for a minute because it had a different type of a time and factor that was different, you know. I, I never played a song like that until, you know, I got to learn it, you know. But that was the most different track, all the tracks, I think. How did it start off? I mean, how did it, the idea start off? The idea start off with, um, well, me and Huff used to go to, um, it was a, a little bar downstairs from the Schubert building. That's when we were in the Schubert building. We used to go down there every day and talk to the barmaid. And, and this guy used to come into to the bar every day. Little guy looked like a judge or something like that, right? So, you know, we're watching everything. See, we're songwriters. So we, we said, everything we're doing, we're thinking about a song, yes. So we see this guy come in there, we said, okay. <laughs> then the next day he come in there again. But when he come in there every day, this girl would come in maybe 10, 15 minutes after he get there. They sit in the same booth, go to the jukebox, play the same songs every day. So me and Huff, we said, oh, that's me and Mrs. Jones or whatever the name we was going to call it. But that's how that song evolved itself. And then when they get ready to leave, he would go his way, she would go hers. So we, it could have been his daughter, it could have been his niece, it could have been, it could have been anybody. But we assumed, we created a story out of this, that there was some kind of romantic uh, uh, connection between these people. And we go upstairs in our office and we wrote the song, Me and Mrs. Jones. Me and Mrs. Jones. But it's much too strong to let it go now. We meet every day at the same cafe, 
6 to 30 Yeah, no one knows she'll be there Holding hands Making all kinds of plans While the jukebox plays Mrs. Jones, Mrs. Jones, Mrs. Jones, Mrs. Jones. We got a thing going on. That's me and Mrs. Jones. It's one of the recordings on a new 4CD box set that collects some of the recordings from Philadelphia International Records, the label that was founded by my guests Kenny Gamble and Leon Huff. They wrote a lot of the hits on their label, including the record that we just heard, and produced a lot of those records, too. And Leon Huff played keyboard on a lot of those records, too, including the one we just heard? Yeah. What do you consider to, to be, like, the end of the, the real, like, glory days of Philadelphia International Records? Hmm. I think it kind of, like, like around about 80, mm. 86 Somewhere around there, 87. Patty LaBelle, we had, we had a big hit with Patty LaBelle around. But it started to fall apart a little bit, like the early 80s. Because? Well, I think people started to evolve. They wanted to do other things. And and, uh, and once you get hot like that, then everybody's after you. You know what I mean? All the record companies was after the artists, you know, and the, the writers wanted to you know, to start their own thing and so forth. And, and that's natural, you know, for people to want to do that, you know. So, so I think we had a good run. We had a, we at least had a good almost 20-year mm. run, strong run, mm. you know. And um, Was music changing also, like hip-hop? Yeah, I think music so. Was yeah, the music was changing also at the same time. How do you feel about that when there's a kind of, like, you, you kind of uh, help create a sound, and then that sound is kind of becoming a little dated as a new sound as hip hop comes in. Well, I was glad to be honest with you. Why were you glad? Well, I was kind of glad because we had worked <laughs> so hard. I mean, even now I'm happy. You know, I mean, I'm thankful for what we had. I'm glad for what we had. But you know, it's it's like I always had a perspective in my mind. I said, I know this is not going to last. Nothing lasts yeah, forever. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, if you talk about that all the time, so you know, it ain't going to last forever. So let's. Let's get the juice out of it now. Whatever we can get, you know. Let's let's mm. keep writing or whatever the case might be. Because I mean, every song we were writing was was, was becoming a smash. So I mean, how long do you think that's gonna last? I mean, mm. you're taking that kind of energy out of yourself. And so uh, when it started to slow down, you know, I was thankful and uh, and I was kind of glad because that schedule was mm. was Brilliant. unbelievable. You know, and you start to feel it after a while. You know. You know, doing 12, 13 albums a year. You know, we had we had a good staff of people working with us, but uh, but it was no question. It, it was a lot Sorry. to get to get one song, one good song. We had to maybe write ten songs. Would you produce all ten and then decide which was best, or just sometimes? Mm-hmm. Sometimes mm-hmm. we would do that. Sometimes, uh, like when the OJ's or Teddy Pendergrass would come in, we would record maybe thirty songs on them. Just to get eight. Um, of the songs that you wrote together, do you have a favorite that we should end with? Yeah, go ahead, Gamble. Well, Love Train. Yeah. Yeah, Love, Love Train. That's, that's, that to me is, uh, um, is the song that um, that kind of capsulizes everything that we were thinking about, the message that we wanted to get out. You know, we're always talking about a message in the music and, and Love Train is like uh, international, uh, very optimistic about life and the world, you know, people living together in harmony and unity, you know. So I think Love Train is um, mm-hmm. something everybody better get on board because yeah. if you miss it, I feel yeah. sorry for you. Those, those you know core beer commercials really made it popular. Yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> thank you both so much. Kenny Gamble, Leon Huff, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you very much for having us.
Kenny Gamble and Leon Huff co-founded Philadelphia International Records and wrote and produced many of the label's hits. Their new box set is called Love Train. A TV companion called Love Train will be shown on many PBS stations in December. Fresh Air's executive producer is Danny Miller. Our engineer is Bob Purdick. Dorothy Farabee is our administrative assistant. Sue Spolin directed the show. I'm Terry Gross. All of us at Fresh Air wish you a happy Thanksgiving.